What's up, everybody? Welcome back to Keith and Mike Watch Deep Space Nine. Today we are talking about Season 3, Episode 25, Facets. I am fascinated to know what you think of this episode. Hello, friends out there, and hello, my friend, Mike and Deglio. How you doing, buddy? Keith, I'm doing good. I'm eating a Tic Tac. I didn't get it choked down before we started. You got a crunch, buddy. You got a I crunch. Know, but... I was just saying to the dear patrons today on my watch along that it's nice to, I think, uh, at least till mid-November, we've uh, things have settled down on my end of the universe so we can get back into our normal loop. We're going to close up Strange New Show. We're going to have so much free time. We're going to do so much great stuff for the patrons. It's just going to be just a, a, just a smorgasbord of availability over here. At, I wonder how like many you're times we've said that. It's not like you're working on anything important or time-consuming. <laughs> Um, hey no man i i i realized like i'm i am now this is just for mike nobody even knows what this is i'm 71 pages in i gotta start wrapping it up so like i i think like i'm a couple weeks from a from a draft hey man i love a draft and we're a, a couple of weeks away from a football draft anyway none of this is important to you folks uh we got we got some some zombieing to do this week some zombieing well we got to bring back some dead daxes oh Oh, oh my god it would be how great would it be if they were all actual zombies so all seven of them were like brains and that know, was they all were like, the we entire can only budget special effects for one wig this week <laughs> that's right that's right anyway I, I i'm excited to talk about that i really like them anyway let us before we get into facets we have to wrap up shakar and give your ratings uh oh yeah if, do have if you it. would like to give your ratings for this episode leave it in the youtube comments below and we will happily talk about it. if you want me to read your treatise leave us a little super tip like our buddy sans deity does every almost every, kind of every week you, mm -hmm. you really don't have to do that anyway Shh. uh <laughs> quiet you <laughs> All right, so here's what you thought of Shakar. Joshua Cronin gave it an 83. Jason Mo, 71. YouTube viewer, 75. Delusions at noon, woof, 49. JD gave it a 77. But Harry Pothead, 90. Warf's big old boot shivs with an 80. And Kevin Miles with an 85. And Sans Didi with said not a super tip. It's a super thanks. I always get it wrong, but just hit the little hard it's button. You're just, you're, it's not easy to accept thanks, you know? It, it's true. It's true. Yes. So Sans Deity says, This episode is just all over the place and seems like it suffers from end of season syndrome. I agree. They're just running out of ideas and throwing anything out there. Uh, so it's Kira's resistant cell buddy steals some, I don't know, farm stuff? Kira helps him out, obviously, because we're all about inner conflict and moral ambiguity. LaForge wouldn't pull this shit. And then Kai Wynn comes along and will just totally deflate the thread we've made of her so we can have a seventh heaven guy or whoever want to be president or whatever. Oh, and O'Brien will play darts. Throw in a Vulcan somehow. They're hilarious. I was especially disappointed in this episode because I typically enjoy episodes where Kira's past as a <coughs> terrorist um, resistance fighter clashes with her new role, which requires more diplomacy and nuance. But they didn't explore nearly that as nearly as much as they could have. I think if done correctly, Shakar could have been in the burial spot without the creepy robot brain death. And the writers could have used him as a better bridge to more Bajoran storylines and ignore the Burial stuff. The biggest sin of this episode is just the terrible juxtaposition of the A and B plots. On one hand, you have a story about a possible civil war and the political future of an entire planet. You have the main character torn between two worlds, and you have Kai Wynn, who was already shown to be a formidable throw, threatening real danger to the stability of what has been built over the last few seasons. And then you got... O'Brien playing darts or some shit. And you just, and you don't even make it interesting or funny. No. The Nah Visitor is the only real bright spot of this episode, but I'm smacking this down with a 29. Wow. I'm sorry. Well, Friggin' Keith, darts. I do want to say, uh, not quite the super thanks, but a, a, a monthly contribution from the mysterious Anne. And she weighed in on this episode on the Patreon, and I felt compelled to share it. Mm. 
Please do. I loved the conversation you guys had about this episode and Kai Wynn. I started to wonder if they were kind of giving her the drumhead treatment in some ways. Mm. The unfortunate pattern of TNG introducing a strong older woman antagonist and then totally undermining the strength by the end of the episode. But the differences I see, we know by now, this isn't the end of Wynn's arc, just a chapter in it. Though they threaten her with public humiliation, that's not what the show and the character chooses. She made a mistake and got in and over her head, but she's back to her savvy self by the end. The audience leaves the episode with a sense of relief. Oof, she's the villain after all. We don't want her in charge of the government. And also the uneasy sense that she will certainly be back and villaining powerfully and more effectively even because of what she's learned somewhere down Ooh. the road. They haven't totally destroyed one of their best villains, just giving her, just given her a setback. I think that the way they do that to win compares pretty favorably over the course of the series with how they handle the ups and downs of Ducat. But you guys are mm. definitely picking up on some of the things they do to undermine her character that I haven't really noticed before, so I'll be paying more attention to that now. Of course, I replied, any genuine insight that we stumble upon, I assure you, is purely coincidental. She tags Keith with, and I will admit that I found Shakar more compelling as the Scottish sex candle ghost, mysterious teenager <laughs> Anne appreciated that episode. <laughs> Oh, that's awesome. Uh, yeah. And I, I'll, I'll talk off air. I, I lost the, I lost her video. I, I was what? like, I was up in Vermont oh. and I was like, I want to watch that whole, I want to sit down and like actually watch it, watch it. But then I, I couldn't find the link again. Anyway, we'll, we'll talk about it later. Uh, if you're on patreon.com slash KNM, there's some really fun stuff up yeah. there. So you're missing out. If you're not getting the full experience, if you're not up there on patreon.com slash KNM, but it's not time to talk about that. Mm -mm. It's time to talk about the episode Facets, and uh, which aired on June 12th, 1995. The top song. Now, I went back and I listened to this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, I, I didn't remember the song, so I, I, if I don't remember it, I will listen to the song. And uh, the question asked in this song, mm -hmm. when I listened to the lyrics of the song, I think he answered his own question with the answer, no. But the question was, have you ever really loved a woman? Brian Adams' uh, treatise on women that he clearly has have maybe you passingly ever really, met. Really, really loved a woman? And then says the stupidest, like, you know, like male assumption stereotypes of what women want yeah. in that song. Hashtag 1995. Whew, ow, I was like, Dude, have you ever even spoken to a woman? <laughs> like, was it, was that, I always forget because all of his songs are like attached to 90s movies that. Oh, was that, that attached was, to something? Was that like the the Kevin Costner led uh, Robin Hood movie? Or I'm thinking. No. That's, no, no, no. That was. Uh, every I would step. Be, no. Uh, no. Uh, oh, wait, hold God, on. They're, they're all the same song. Um. No, but that was but that was a way better. Yeah, it's uh, in D major. I can tell you that it's in D major. Uh, Prince of Thieves song. It was Brian Adams. Yeah, it's in D major. I everything guess. I do, yeah. everything, everything I, I do, do, I do it, I do for, it for you. Shit, See, that made forest. more sense. <laughs> <laughs> this uh, but this Robin Hood was, wasn't was doing great. it for for her. Robin Hood was doing it for the poor, right? Uh, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretending was... to be altruistic because <laughs> I get just bone. want a bone. <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag 1995. Wow. Thanks, wow. Brian Adams, so for much. your contributions. Yeah, speaking of 1995, and speaking of guilty pleasures, the top movie was Congo. No idea what that also is. Also based on the Michael Crichton novel. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's, isn't that, it's another, like, uh, genetic something got somethinged. Yes, they yes, they had I I don't think it was genetic manipulation, but they had they had gorillas up and they were going after like space diamond laser thingies and they were like super powered or something and they mm -hmm. were dangerous. I mean, that movie is trash, mm -hmm. but it's a really enjoyable romp with a remarkable cast. Uh just to keep like what Bruce Campbell's in this? Bruce Campbell it makes perfect sense that he's in this. Anyway, uh yeah, you know what? Go watch Congo. It's entertaining. It's it's hot nonsense, okay. but I enjoyed it. Uh, okay, I got other things to watch. I gotta look, do some lower decks. 
No, man, they've got like super gorillas, and they have to fight them with like with like uh, diamond lasers. Yeah, it's awesome. That's How right. would you not want to watch that? I mean, I've watched it. I think I've I think I've squared that circle for myself. I don't know. I mean, you clearly didn't watch it well enough, because otherwise <laughs> you'd want to see it again. Yeah. Congo, Mike, no. Okay. What were we watching uh, on television? It's summertime, Keith. So it's all everything's in reruns. So nothing to report. I will say that. In a smart move, Fox moved America's Most Wanted, usually their Saturday joint, to Monday night event, I guess, for the summer of 95, mm -hmm. which uh, I would have enjoyed because that was my j, j j jam I loved America's Most Wanted back in the day. Never got to call the tip line, though, probably fortunately. I didn't know any serial killers hiding in my neighborhood. Oh, good Although uh, we had one living there we knew for sure because, Keith, quickly, just a quick mention, our oh, here we go. high school principal that... Uh, if, uh, the, in the 80s, where I went to school, um, mm -hmm. murdered the English teacher uh, and her <laughs> two small children and was found guilty of such, but on a fringe technicality, had his conviction, what's the word, uh, overturned. tossed out, overturned, and instead of, like, in shame, height moving away, lived in our neighborhood and mowed his grass every weekend, and he just saw mass mur multi murderer uh, J.C. Smith in the neighborhood until he died in the nineties. Wow! There is my an ABC school. miniseries. Oh my god! That we should apps. If I got to get my hands on it and watch it for the patrons, it's called Echoes in the Darkness, and it is my high school, my English teacher. It's the whole thing. They did a minute. That's crazy. Yeah, it's a book too. Yeah, it's actually a really sad story, of course. Um, and well, uh, they never found the bodies because the, uh, the the rumor was all through high school I was in is that he had used, there had been a bunch of pool like acid to make the, what do you recall, the, the floor, chlorine, chlorine and stuff, and yeah. that he had disintegrated the bodies in the basement of the school to, to, to dispose of them, which I'm sure is an urban legend, but who knows, they never found the bodies. Wow, uh, yeah, Echoes interestingly. In the Darkness, the story of J.C. Smith, uh, Upper Marion Area High School, check it out. Well, it, you know, it's funny you say J.C. because uh, my, uh, my high school principal was a J.C. Penny model, so there you go. Okay, it's, don't, it's pretty pretty much just as exciting. <laughs> <laughs> the loosest like, of threads tying these two uh, things together. Look at my 1989 khakis. All right, uh, let's keep going uh, with what was Voyager doing. Well, Voyager was doing nothing because they decided not to air four of their episodes and just go straight to the off season. All right, the all weekly right. world news headline. Uh, maybe this is what your principal needed. The chair of death kills again. It also, the chair itself was a serial killer having claimed 64 lives since 1702. Wow. New Jersey woman dared to sit in the cursed seat and becomes victim Keith, number 64. That's the bold headline, but let's not forget the small print here. Sexy new underwear smells like sweat and drives the ladies wild. <laughs> I almost barfed in my mouth. And you realize this is not the cover because I have to edit the covers sometimes because they're they're too offensive <laughs> even to put on the air and laugh at. So Wow. That's crazy. New Jersey woman dared to sit in cursed seat and becomes victim number wow, sixty-four. Wow. There it is. All right, so let's get into facets, shall we? Season 3, episode 24, directed by Cliff Bowl, who last directed Explorers, which we very liked. And sadly, this is Cliff's last episode directing Deep Space Nine. He went on to direct a bunch of Voyager episodes, but this is a series wrap on Cliff Bowl. And it was written by Rene Echevarria, who also wrote Explorers. So we brought back that team because uh, we liked that episode. So now, Mike, it is time for you to hit a certain button. Keith can't wait to hit it. Yeah, I know you can't. Now, Keith, waste your time with Trivial Trivia. Ba, 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 okay, here we are. The scenes involving Cisco as Duran, the, uh, the bad guy, had to be shot twice because the producers were unhappy with the first set of dailies. The reason for this is they felt Avery Brooks' performance was too creepy. According to the visual effects supervisor, Gary Wait, there was, Hutzel, a, there was a creepier version? A creepier. Brooks spoke yeah. in an almost inaudible whisper. Uh, a great choice. I, 
What a give choice. me that one. Yeah. I like I, he was great and super creepy, but like I would have loved. I, I want to see the alternate cut. That's with, gotta um, exist, right? No, you said it was just dailies, right? Well, but they, I mean, they shot it. So yeah, but it's it, on film somewhere. Yeah, that's true. They just never cut it into the episode. So no, no, they, they, no, they never cut it. But here we go. But did you, you did you Google it by any chance? I uh, know. I, I I doubt it's out there. But you never know. These these things do end up on the internet sometimes. You look it up while I tell you that in order to achieve Odo's new look after he embodies Curzon. Makeup designer Michael Westmore got a photograph of actor Frank Owen Smith, who portrayed Curzon in Emissary. He never spoke a line, but we saw his face and digitally morphed the two together onto Odo's makeup, which I thought was tremendously effective. Say that again. I'm sorry. I was in the weeds. Plus, I had to stop that research because clearly there were spoilers abound. So I backed Don't out. Get out of there. Uh, that for, for the half Curzon, half Odo makeup, they did a digital morph of the of the actor who played Curzon in uh, Emissary. Oh, cool. Yeah, I thought it was really awesome. I thought the design was really cool. Super good. In the scene involving O'Brien's Tobin, Jadzia mentions that Tobin had the most original approach to the proof, some scientific mathematical mm -hmm. proof, since Wiles over 300 years ago on Fermat's Last Theorem. That's what it was. This is a nod to Wiles's solution to the Fermat Last Theorem, which had been published merely a month before filming of this episode. The mathematical formula had previously been mentioned by Captain Picard in Next Generation, the, Ro the Royale, and referred to it as remaining unsolved. So between they did that then, Miles apparently solved it, and they worked it into the episode pretty cool. Uh, you know, for us nerds out there. This episode also features the first mention of root beer. Uh, which will, of course, play a much larger role as we move forward. Oh, interesting, because uh, that's such a toss-away line. It's a, well, you know, sometimes the toss-away lines become yeah. part of the uh, the lexicon, which was kind of cool. Ira Stephen Bear wanted to do a version of the 1976 TV movie Sybil about a woman played by Sally Field with dissociative identity disorder, um, which couldn't really... They had to sort of, you know, zag a little bit, but that was the inspiration for uh, this episode. Have you episode. watched that, by the way? I don't think I have. Uh, we watched it in psychology in eighth grade, and it was really good. Yeah, well, I, I she won awards for that, did yeah. she not? Mm -hmm. I think so. Uh, and lastly, they were originally going to use Keiko for one of the hosts, but Rosalind Chow was not available, so they tagged in Lita for her second appearance. And like, what do you got, show? Lita? And she's like, I got acrobatics, I got bar work, I got flexibility. There it is. But I guess so. they have they kiki off uh, off stage. I can't believe I just used that that word. Um I don't even know what that means. It's it's like a I I I know it in the context of like drag lexicon. It's like when two drag queens like are chitting and chatting and becoming girlfriends, you know. Oh. And uh they the her and her and Le her Le Lita Dax. Yeah, Lita and Dax, yeah. Must be doing that off screen because she's like, you are my seven closest people I know. On the entire And station. I was like, Quark? This lady? But Well, know, Quark, cool. Quark definitely. But yes, they, they were aware of that on the on the production level. Uh, <laughs> but you do what it, you got to do. It's, it's going to make more sense retroactively than it does at this point in the story. So... Uh, Lita is going to be with us, mm -hmm. but it is definitely... Uh, oh, it totally makes sense. And also, you can tell right away in this episode, and this is not a, a pejorative, but, you know, generally I've noticed on the treks that your penultimate episode of a season is usually like, we're out of budget, so this is going to be bottled up. Can we get scenes with just two people in a room? And we get right. a lot of that in this episode. We just pair them off, which is kind of cool. So it makes yep. sense. Yep, yep. Uh, all, you know, and also thinking about that, like... I think they were more self-conscious about it than they needed to be because think about it. Uh, Dax is friends with all these people other than Quark, like work friends. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my work friends don't know all of my friends mm -hmm. and my real friends don't know all of my work friends. So it would, it would make sense that there'd be like some outlier if we only see one half of her life. Yeah. hundred percent. So, all right, you know who else is 100% gets 100% of our love and maybe a little bonus thing this week that I just pitched to Mike before we begin the episode. It's our patrons at patreon.com slash KNM. Mike, do the spiel. You know, Keith, 
YouTube demonetizes just about everything. God forbid you even think of a song out loud. We talked about Brian, uh, whatever his name is. What's that guy's name? Brian Adams. Brian Adams too much this episode, and I think they're going to demonetize us for that. Oh, uh, now you now you care about being I'm demonetized? I'm just saying. So it, we count on our Patreon supporters to help keep the coffers. <laughs> I'll use the word full <laughs> and then laugh. But... To thank them, we put this slide up and we talk about them and we gush about them when we read their comments and we thank them and we love them and every once in a while we throw them some extra content. Uh, you get to see me watching all of the Star Treks. You get to see some video game stuff. You get to see just, and you get a page. You keep, you also get an RSS feed of all of our stuff, all of our podcasts distilled down into one place. And then I butcher their names for all to hear. Bryant, Kimball, Beersock, Casey Clark, Jason Moe, Joshua Cronin, we hope to yeah. see some of his cosplay. Andrew Hayes, Jorge Navoa on, on the Toys Show, not just for fun. And the mysterious, thanks for your comments, always. Worf's big old boot shivs. Charles b -b 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 Babbage's. Richard Coleman, Harry Pothead. CRM Productions, Nikolay Ivanovich Lobachevsky. Delusions at Noon. Steve Brown, YouTube viewer. <laughs> JD Mix. Colin Dagan, Chris Mitchell, CRM. Pat, know our address. So does Josh Cronin. You can too, but you have to want to send us something cool. Yeah, well, and boy, do we have some. It's gonna, it's gonna take a while, but we might have something super cool coming to uh, us. And a new I can name only to add say to the list. that the K and M viewers and patrons are the best, except for some of those who take hard exception to our political views that we rarely share. Uh, but uh, we don't apologize. We feel the way we feel, Keith. We love each and every one of you. Check us out, K and M. Or uh, no, patreon.com slash can. I mean, oh, you tight. It was going to be so good. Yeah. All right. Well, that's all right. Uh, you, you, you know what? You carry strong. We got to the end. I did it. My ankle oh. hurts like hell. But, it hurt. it and hurts. And I think bad. there's gonna, some sort of uh, child abuse have, involved in this, but. 100%. Well, way to take it there. So I'm not going to carry you off anymore. No. All right. So let us talk about our guest stars here for Facets. We have Jeffrey Allen Chandler as the Trill Guardian, Max Grodenchik as Rom. Aaron Eisenberg as Non, Chase Masterton as Lita, and of course, we hear a little bit of Magil Barrett as the computer voice. Nice to have her there. What do you say we head into the screening room? Yeah, Keith, but we can't forget those awesome stunt fighters who, they don't really hide very well at all, but we'd like to thank them too. Skinny Avery <laughs> Brooks, super skinny. He's already very fit, but the skinnier version who takes a mm -hmm. punch or two. Yeah, 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 uh, we'll, we'll get there. Yeah, here we go. Okay, so in our teaser, we begin with Nog piloting a runabout yeah, he is. or a shuttle. I think it's a shuttle. Uh, and uh, look out, he's attacked by Cardassians, but it's just a simulation, and he is interrupted by Jake knocking on the window in space. I, I thought that was really cute. Me I love too, the... though I was a little confused because Jake seems to have, de they like de they Netflix de-aged him. He looks like younger this episode, doesn't he? I didn't think so. Oh, I was I was like, did they film this out of order? Okay. I mean, Don't they definitely me. didn't de-age him. No, I know, I just, <laughs> he's looking, he just looks younger. I don't know. He does well, but he got a, he got a closer shave this week. Yeah, in Voyage or in the one where he, they're sailing on the sail ship, he looks like he's forty, but here he. That's that's true. Well, you know, look, we're we're going. When when you're that age, everything's different every day. So. Do you know what I was thinking in this, Keith? I have to say, if I can, let me pull up a picture. This is kind of a total non sequitur, but uh, that's you a know, first. Uh, you know how Star Trek is often credited with their uh this isn't i'll just make a point very quickly credited for like sort of predicting the future the design of this like area so mimics the current design of the xbox series x the green and the sort of graded panels and whatnot it's very much that design aesthetic I, i'd be surprised if they somebody didn't take inspiration from this oh that's interesting yeah sort of the the great grid thing yeah well per, perhaps well, let me, may, let me maybe maybe nog was just can... playing the xbox Oh yeah, you know what I mean. Like that is—it's giving me very much that exact vibe. That's that's true. 
All right. Sorry. Huh, interesting. That's, well, I propose nothing. There you go. There it is. Well, I mean, but the holodeck, the Xbox is just sort of like the proto holodeck. That's fair. As it be, as it gets better, that's where it's where we're headed. Anyway, uh, Nog is preparing for the Academy exam, so he has to sort of take a test before he can take the test, mm -hmm. uh, and he's preparing for the pretest, and he's very determined to be a cadet. I sort of I got the impression that that. Cisco's recommendation sort of made him a shoe in but I guess not. That only got him consideration, right? That's right. No, the to get into the academy is incredibly competitive. And we saw Wesley Crusher go through that on Next Gen. And I, I think it's great that it's subtly juxtaposed with reminding us how difficult it was to become a host for the right. symbiotes. Right. I mean, there's obviously some some pretty strong parallels going on here. Uh, yeah, it's good writing. You get, you get mm -hmm. the parallel stories. Yeah, and then we get to disrupt that good writing by Quark telling him that instead they should write porn. We, yes, yes. Uh, you know, but it, it, it makes sense. It's where the money is. Mm -hmm. Quark is annoyed that jo Nog wants to join Starfleet. He wants to hire Jake to write dirty hollow sweet stories. Keith, in an alternate universe, maybe you pitched to me one time that we should write porn. <laughs> I did not pitch that. Somebody pitched that to me, and I passed it along. <laughs> I was just the intermediary. Uh, I'm going to get a text about that. <laughs> <laughs> no. Hey, no. I, I, I have been saying that What did I say about a, the coffers? We're, tr we're trying to fill them up. As a professional writer, I have been desperately trying to sell out for 20 years. Just nobody's selling or buying. <laughs> I'm, I will happily write anything. Yeah, that is All right. fair. That is fair. Anyway, the senior staff, plus Bashir's new squeeze, Lita, have been summoned to the wardroom by Dax to help her go through the ritual of Gentrara. The idea is to allow Jadzia to meet all of her previous hosts, and to do so, she needs to borrow everyone's bodies. And that is at the end of our Act 1. I tell you what, like I like this scene because we get to spend some time in the wardroom, which we added just for you know for season three i think it's one of the best sets on the on the the show it's not super flashy but i just love the design of it and that's sort of like a i would love for my living room to be that design mm -hmm. i mean my basement pretty much is already but uh anyway thought it was cool so in act one what a cool technology they have too but i guess it's not i guess it's not technology we don't really know the whole magic of it the sort of voodoo of to, to make this work but it is it is a cool concept yeah because it, it's sort of like half i don't think it's intended to be necessarily spiritual but there's some sort of a magic to it there's some sort of a thing we don't understand it feels like the trill though like in in your the majority of these people went through starfleet right so you'd think in your education at some point you'd come up upon the idea of the of the ceremony, but they all seem to be pretty ignorant of it. So I guess maybe it's either that you don't come across many trill, or it's a lesser known thing. Well, I I think it's I think it's just the scarcity of trill, mm -hmm. right? Because like I I don't know how many joined trills there are. I, I, mean, I think Dax might be the only one yeah. in Starfleet, mm -hmm. and so because it you does might... sound it's sort of like a trill quinceanera, basically. It, it it is it is yeah. kind of yeah, this is your lives. So uh, the ritual telepathically transfers the previous host's memories into a willing participant. Bashir brings up the subject of who gets to be Duran, the murderer with a thousand masks. But everybody is in, including eventually Quark, after he is briefly ear jerked off by <laughs> Jadzia. And that wasn't at all remotely uncomfortable to be part of i mean like if we are if we are to truly believe that for for Rengis, that's where the magic happens right mm -hmm. this is a very overtly dirty thing to happen constantly in public in front of Clark. everyone yeah i was thinking the yeah. same thing if, like if, the, if those are the earballs right that's that's uh that's weird also anyway. i feel like this is and we do not have to get into the weeds of this but from a writing perspective i know this is supposed to just be a funny beat but the truth is is that this is like a seems to be a pretty intimate experience. Mm -hmm. So yeah. since Quark is like, I'm out, 
why would you, why jerk them off, right? Just like get somebody else, basically? Because it doesn't seem to be that, when we get, we finally get to the magic of it, it doesn't seem to be that big of a deal. So just pick somebody else, man. Well, I mean, from a <laughs> practical standpoint, obviously we need to get Quark involved. But I, I, I don't think it's, I, I think it is an intimate thing. I think it is, I think it is important. And I think that like, she, you know, she knows he's going to be reluctant because anything altruistic is out of Quark's, yeah. you know, personality structure. But she also knows that he's he's going to do it. She just has, you know, he, he's going to make her go through the extra step of talking him into it because that's the way Quark works. That's Ever. part of their relationship. That's what I think. So, uh, meanwhile, O'Brien is officiating Nog's academy tests in the Hollow Suite. And uh, he's holding in his hands the pad from the previous episode where Bashir wrote, go away, which is the pad that he's holding. Uh, they didn't expect that to be AI upscaled. Mm -hmm. And when they when eventually they get down to uh, rescanning the footage, I don't know, are they going to clean that up or just leave it there as That's an funny. Easter egg? That's funny. Uh, but that is exactly what that is. So he begins Nog's stress reaction test, which Nog's expects to be in the shuttle, but is on ops, of course, because you know you can't you can't test him on stress reaction. I think he's practiced. So it begins. Then a Trill Guardian dude arrives on the station to facilitate the memory transfers, and he mentions that Jedzia kept putting off the ritual. Drop that little nugget. We don't follow it up yet, but we're gonna get there. Then the first ceremony begins with Kira, who will be Dax's first host. We see the transfer happen, and then Nana Visitor gets to play a completely different character, Leela, as a little old lady. Sort of, she she gives me like RBG vibes here. Yeah, I can see it. I like it. And uh, in Act Two, the Trill guy tests the transfer. Leela hasn't had consciousness since the last time they did this with Curzon, and Dax now doesn't remember Leela's life. This answers the question that I think I had of whether or not the previous hosts have any consciousness. Clearly they in do. The body. They, no, they do not. Oh, right, 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 because the last time she remembers is the... She, because Leela only has consciousness during this ceremony. All the memories are there, but she doesn't have consciousness. So theoretically then, after you as a host die, Right, you kind of beam back to life for two hour instances every re every time there's a new every host. generation. Yeah, yeah. That's what? probably that's. Uh, I don't know that that's just let me be dead. I don't know that I even want that. <laughs> like that's a weird. No, I mean, wouldn't it be fun to like go and like see what's going on eighty years from now and then eighty years I again? I guess then... assuming like I'd be like just be careful whatever you do be careful because I want this to continue. Yeah, but if it doesn't, who cares? Yeah, that's a good point. The, the stakes are pretty low, mm -hmm. right? So, For me, anyway. this was really just a, a really cool sort of improv experience to watch our main cast members as actors get a as chance act, to flex right, a little uh, bit. For sure. Uh, they chat for a while, and Leela was a legislator, and we learned that Dax picked up the hands behind her back thing from Leela, which cool. is a great sort of, we've seen Dax do that the whole series, mm -hmm. and now to get a little bit, little bit of a backstory there, it's great. Uh, Nana gives a terrific performance as the old lady. Like, just, you know, as as always, some of these are more successful than others, but Nana, you know was going to crush this. Yes. Next up yeah, you is O'Brien. You're, like, you're like, even pre, you're like, I want to see Nana, Avery, and Renee. Those are the three I want to see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, for sure. And, and, and I think their choices of who they gave what to. I mean, of course, they... They gave Nana the biggest feature because she, you know, she was going to be great. We're going to do the whole, you know, explain the world through her scene. Uh, it's great, great. So next up is O'Brien as Tobin Dax, and he's a nervous fellow who bites O'Brien's nails. Uh, I thought that was really funny. Like, stop biting your host nails. Mm -hmm. It was a cute little detail there. Uh, he, Calm does a an American accent, and he's a bit of a nerd, but apparently very smart. Then it's Lita's turn, and we find out that Dax's third host was a gymnast. Uh, <laughs> Colm got to play that. The voice is a little much, but it was yeah. it was cute. I got the idea. We've we've all played a nerd, right, Mike? Never. 
Where, where's the what? What show is it that you sent me the picture of you sitting on a roll of toilet paper? Toilet paper. Oh, that you was were I was the hacker. <clears throat> yeah, I wasn't even playing. That was a. I was supposed to. That was Keith. You're really blowing up reality television here. That was a reality TV show on MTV where I was supposed to legit be a hacker. Like, it was this weird show. <clears throat> is there footage of this somewhere? I'd, yeah, I'd it, love it, to see it that. It aired on MTV UK, so I don't know if it's... I'm sure you could find it. It was called Only Find... in the UK? It was called Find My First Love, I think, something like that. And basically, the whole premise of the show was like, oh, my first love, like, I can't find them, they're off the grid. But the truth is, is that they were able to Google these people instantly. Like, it's... There was no actual solving of mysteries necessary. <laughs> it was weird. And so they invented this whole character, like me, with, with like... Fake screens of white hat hacking in the background in like, your apartment. In, in my the apartment, store, yeah. I, I just beamed in on Zoom. Oh, I, you know, you get those, you get those pays, the monies. But I, there, there was sometimes I would film like with just no pants. <laughs> Jen was taking pictures of me like propping up on on. <laughs> it's so stupid. But oh yeah. wait, it's it's on FYI. Oh, here in America. I think I need to. All right, it's totally possible. All right, All so right. guys. You can go to fyi.tv you need to sign in with your TV provider, but all the episodes are there. We're going to get a clip at some point. Yeah, it was uh, one of the easiest jobs I ever had because it was all improv, too. I didn't shoot. It was just like, you know, it was reality TV. So the, the, I think I'm not sure the participants in the thing knew I was all, <laughs> I knew you were I was crap, but it was, it was fun. Hilarious. All right. Anywhere. Where were we? Lita okay. is a gymnast. And we uh, we see Chase do some flopping around. That's fun. Uh, couldn't help but talk about her physical form, but you know, 90s. Then it's Quark's turn, who's playing an old lady who used to be in charge of the Symbiosis Commission. It is interesting that she used to be part uh, in charge of the Symbiosis Commission, considering uh, Jadzia's relationship with them. Mm -hmm. um, they're leaning on the pretty hard on the gender swap here for comedy. I'm not sure how I feel about it I looking actually, at it now. You know, I felt okay about it. The only I would have just what I thought was the thing that takes it away from actually being a really I think moving scene because I think look, it's not it's it's not subtle, you know, that Quark is playing the woman and with given his feelings and his species feelings on gender equality. I think it's more powerful if they don't have the him beaming in to be to show his uh to complain about to complain it complain about it had they just because i thought he was giving a pretty subtle yeah effective feminine performance until they kind of like well the only thing that i thought was uncomfortable was oh it's a boy pretending to be a girl as the source of it, like for laughs like that's the entire but it was only laughs it. when he pulls through the curtain if you take that no, pulling through the curtain off i no, don't think it is like oh i'm a mother when you when you are breastfeeding a baby i feel like obviously that's all played for laughs oh i didn't feel that way oh interesting yeah well anyway it happened what did you uh, think yeah what are you th what are your thoughts uh and, but uh but i mean armin, armin played it straight which was the the right way yeah, to do that's it. how i took it until <laughs> until yeah, we we might have an episode coming up later that is not going to handle this as well as this. Oh, anyway, so, okay. Well, so maybe you're coloring your feelings based on future. It's possible. It's possible. Uh, so we'll we'll get there, and that'll be an inter interesting discussion for sure. Anyway, then Bashir plays Tarias, who died young but was brash and cocky. Uh, which I thought this I thought this was a was a good performance here. I, we we talked about Darius before, who died in the shuttle accident. Um, but I I think that in this episode, a lot of these characters get fleshed out. These previous hosts get fleshed out way more. And I don't mm -hmm. think we mentioned that Darius was super cocky, but it, it totally makes sense. And I think it's a good color. And it and it was something you know that Alex is going to do well. Well, I think what it what it, look these scenes are very short, like you said, and yeah. What, but I, what I think they as, uh, successfully achieve, you don't get a ton of lore from each of the characters, but what you do get, I think, is a pretty good understanding of the breadth of life experience that mm. the hosts can bring to one to to, to the current host. And I think yeah. that that is something that when you hear about it, you know, it, it offhandedly through 
exposition in other episodes it doesn't have the impact of when you see it and realize that these are like fleshed out human experiences that are within her. It, it add, yeah. does add a, a color that I think is interesting to the character and to the show moving and, forward. And, and you know, a diverse mix of people. And I, you know, and I think obviously as we're, the episode is called facets, right? So these are all facets of Dax's personality now. Mm -hmm. And so we can sort of point to various moments where everybody here is represented in something we see from Dax at some point. Um, and I think that's really good. You know, of course, you know, this is a sci-fi version of saying there's this bunch of people in all of us. And uh, I liked it. It's pretty cool. Uh, but then it's Cisco's turn to play Jarrell, the murderer who represents the darkness that is within all of us behind a force field. So in Act 3, they set up the scene like Hannibal Lecter and Clarice. Um, they do, yeah. Very obviously. <clears throat> Hold on, Keith, I need to do something. What's that, buddy? Hold on, I'm going to bring it in here. Uh, it's something we, we generally get to do on your end. It's a little easier, but uh, I have to do it. Here we go. See if I can bring it in. Okay, we're gonna get demonetized. No, 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 no. This is I'm bringing in Tuxy Cam because <gasps> Tux Cam. This is how he d rides the show out with me, which is very difficult to uh, to focus sometimes, and why buttons get hit that aren't supposed to be. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, uh, buddy. We're recording the show, and he's just uh -huh. on top of all the things. Tux, what's up, bro? Yeah, but, uh, very helpful. Yeah, very thanks. helpful. Thanks, man. You gonna oh. just sit on the buttons? You, you, uh, I can see you've you've got a ship that JD sent you there. Mm -hmm. You've got the beanbag chair. <laughs> There's JD. All right. Cute. All right. Thanks Cute. for thanks for indulging. Yeah, there it oh, is. Wait, okay. uh, oh, 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 he's out. He's out. Like I didn't want to be on camera. Did I tell you I <laughs> no, consented to be on camera? You'll be camera. hearing from my lawyers. A hundred percent. Hilarious. Well. Uh, yeah, Charlie now just sits on my keyboard uh, when, I, when I'm typing. It's very frustrating. So here's well, I'll do I'll do the same thing. So in order to get him to leave me alone, uh, I took a blanket and folded up because he's like a little prince and he wants to be on his on his blanket and it works. So hold on, I can let me, now I can zoom in on him, and you can see right there. He is. Uh, yeah, he's living the dream too. We got a beanbag cat. We got we got chair cat. Yes. Well, let, let we it never be said that Keith and I don't take care of our animals. No, it's just for damn sure. Well, we've put the cats to sleep. Let's yep. keep putting the audience to sleep, and uh, talk about the scene with Cisco as Jarrell. Cisco is creepy, but I would love to see the original take on it. As I said, I would be blown away. If the if the director if we didn't discuss pre beat this scene with we're going for it, give me Silence of the Lambs. Yeah. Oh, it's no question. One hundred percent. He tells Jedzia that she's nothing compared to the other hosts. You're just a little girl unworthy of Dax, and this lands a bit on Jedzia. Jarrell says you can be strong by using me. Lower the force field, and you'll never have to be afraid again. I don't know exactly what the play is here, but like, look at that. That's a great screenshot. Look at the eyes. Go back one. Look at his eyes. Mm -hmm. That's that's scary. I actually think this is where the episode really. I applaud Deep Space Nine because leading up to this moment, just everything we know about everything, I would have put a a, a hefty wager on this interaction being the sort of nuts and bolts the of the episode. Yeah, right. this being, because up until this point, we haven't really had any dramatic tension. There hasn't been any sort of obstacle to overcome, which is pretty pretty uh, basic premise or b needs for an episode of yeah, television. Yeah, we, we basically, it's just stuff happening. There isn't really a story yet. Yeah, you know, the fulcrum of antagonist and here it is and I thought for sure the rest of the episode would play this out he was going to escape and hijinks would ensue and we'd have to you know yeah. capture him or whatever but it's the fact that they swerve from that and just leave this as a nugget to plant doubt in her head which will play into the next little arc is really really smart stuff and we're going to play with this dynamic later yeah and it's cool uh, that the negative experiences she had with each of these characters live in there as well. So it's not just right. the good stuff. 
No, it's the whole the whole bag. Uh, pretty cool. So uh, she won't lower the force field, so he starts to crash into the force field, injuring Cisco. Dax tells Cisco to take back over, and Duran, being a very smart Hannibal Lecter, pretends he's Cisco. So Dax lowers the force field, which, which, I I love that sequence because like of course he did, mm -hmm. um, and uh, she does, and he chokes her, and then their stunt doubles duke it out before Cisco reemerges. Mm -hmm. uh, Stump, stunt doubles, 90s, standard definition. They were just not thinking that was going to be yeah. as obvious as it was. Also, like, wasn't intricate fight choreography? I feel like they could have done it, but maybe there's a union thing. It, it probably was, or... Yeah, I, I feel like they could have done that. Both yeah. of them would have would have done that. But, look, you know, stunt performers deserve to work and uh, and be paid, too. So. Or they added that beat later. You know, it could have mean originally he just was, like, self flagellating Cisco, and then later they were like, let's add a fight scene in. Huh. No, it, I think... Yeah. It, it's, I, I bet they did it, but whatever it is, uh, good job, stunt doubles. Well done. Um, kudos. Kudos. Cisco reemerges, hooray, we're safe. In Quark's, Rom nervously watches the Hollow Suite, hoping Nog is doing well. Rom makes an entrance that literally made me laugh out me loud. Me too. LOL. That was... Mm -hmm. Ha hilarious i don't know if that was uh uh if if that was max's idea or the direction but whatever it was that was chef i just gotta say rom v2 is like my one of my faves rom's amazing yeah. rom is fantastic it was and the now, last episode that dealt with this kind of stuff that where he kind of emerged from his little cocoon that's right that's right and it has now played through the whole uh moogie thing now this yeah no this is rom mm -hmm. Right, we we have met a guy named Rom. Do I have a Rom to keep season? in my box of Deep Space Niners? Uh, I don't know if I gave you one. There is a Rom figure. Uh, I don't know if I gave you one, but uh, you ha you'll have to dive back in there. You have more context for everything. Mm -hmm. But but yeah, no, I mean like Rom, everybody loves Rom, and and like Rom Rom is such a great character, and it is great now to be see the fully formed Rom who will now go on his journey, which is. Awesome. So uh, anyway, Rom shows Quark a cadet's uniform that he had Garrick make in anticipation. It is a very sweet gesture. And and what I love here is Quark's like, you idiot. If he gets in, they're going to give him one. And he's like, well, now we'll have two. It's so like earnest and honest. Like he's not in any way, his balloon is not popped by that. Rom's great. I love Rom. We all we all wish we had a Rom in our lives. Uh, then C uh, Cisco and Jedzia discuss the fact that Jarrell's criticisms are hitting home. She's starting to doubt her value because it's not really Jarrell the problem. She's still stung by Curzon washing her out of the initiate program at first. Uh, which we had discussed a couple of times mm -hmm. in previous episodes. So this is pretty well set up. And she's going to get a chance to confront him, but she's nervous about it. So the transfer happens, and Odo is going to be taking on the role of Curzon. And we get a really terrific for 1995. I, I think I it like, still really? holds. Because we've that seen still some holds up. We've seen some less than terrific effects. Yeah. But this morph well, effect was very good. It was a terrific morph. You know, morphing of like one person to another was much more doable at that point than some of the other things they were trying to do. I I did one for a school video, like probably that year myself. Um, anyway, uh, it's still it's still a really good, very effective. Yeah, and it's morph. subtle. You know, the makeup design is slightly different. The clearly the wig, and then I feel like they did a, like maybe a, a nose prosthetic. Yeah, he's a different nose. Yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, so we meet half Curzon, half Odo. Really cool idea. Is this a figure? Um, no. This is a good figure. This is a good custom figure mm -hmm. idea. I, I would. I'd bet a dollar. Uh, you know, Josh, Joshua, Josh Cronin's got a got one of these somewhere on the shelf. Um, anyway, but the the fact that he sort of we see a physical representation of of Curzon because of its being Odo. Great idea. 
and he smiles. And it's weird to see Odo smile. He only, he's only seen it like twice in the se- in the series thus far. Listen, and I'm going to say this, and I say it with yeah. love, true love and respect to all of our actors on this show. Uh huh. Because you know, I love Nana, and I think Avery Brooks is incredible, and I think Terry Farrell is incredible in this episode specifically. But if you want to see an actor completely transform and yeah. give you a completely different take, all you need to watch is this episode. Odo like, in the beginning and at the end versus yeah, this. Holy shit. Renee's performance in this is astounding. It's a whole good. character. I would totally believe, even though I know it's Renee and I know it's Odo, that this is just a new character on the show and they decide to it, it. And And I'm, I'm watching it and Odo is gone for me. Yeah. It is entirely this new person. And so, to, to, yeah. as a, to pre-beat, we're going to get an entirely different Odo in a new context after this performance. You know yeah, what I mean? It, we don't we don't see just it doesn't return to Odo. You see an Odo on a journey. I mean, Renee gives you three specific different characters in this episode, and it's awesome. Yeah. Well, and you know, as we as we know already at this point, the character who gets the most development, other than possibly Nog, is Odo mm-hmm. throughout the series, without question. So uh, we're in Cisco's quarters, and Curzon arrives to meet Ben. I also wrote <laughs> Renee's performance is remarkably different from his usual Odo. And he has blown off Jadzia to hang out with Cisco. And uh, w- we got a problem. It's not Curzon, it's half Odo, half Curzon. And something went wrong with the ritual because it's a shapeshifter. Yeah, you knew that so, was coming. Yeah, you knew something's going to go wrong. So, uh, Curzo brings up Cassidy Yates, and then drags them to Quark's. Odon? T- <laughs> Odon, Cur- Curzo. Curzo, I like Curzo. Curzo, I think Curzo. Uh, anyway, he teases Quark by kissing him on the forehead. Quark is good and weirded out. Good beat of him bumping into the thing, I like that. Uh, then Jedzia shows up, and Curzo kinda hits on her. This will make more sense later. Then he changes outfits. Also love that concept mm-hmm. and love the execution of that. Because, like, Odo can change his outfit anytime he wants. Because it's not even real. Um, like that very much. Cisco, being emotionally intelligent, smartly makes himself scarce so Curzo and Jadzia can talk. Good. That is some good friending. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I think Cisco does a lot of good friending in this episode. So Jadzia wants to have a serious conversation. But Curzo just wants to goof off. And drink some Sunny D. And drink some Sunny D and goof off. And uh, I still want to know where that goes in Odo. It's just flatting down the floor underneath him. <laughs> He's just like pooping it out a little bit. Uh, also, so, it's like the makeup design is incredible. And the costuming, like, uh, Curzo is awesome. Yeah. Well, and it's a, it's a completely different facial prosthetic they put on, on Renee yeah. there. Um, it's very effective. Somebody on the like makeup and design monster team got to like go to it's probably work. Westmore, probably yeah. Michael Westmore. Um, but it's it's really great. And, and as we have mentioned, I don't know somewhere in this, Odo's face prosthetic was newly done for every single day of shooting. So it's yeah. So you can actually buy them because um, was Renee if you can get them all all off in one piece, saved them and, and auctioned them off for charity. Oh, that's cool. Super cool. So they're they're out there. I think I might want one. Anyway, uh That's so weird. I mean it's we weird, start an episode but... and we do come from the wipe of the intro and it's just Keith in a in an Odo mask. I'm like Whoa. Hello Clarice. All right. Uh Keitho. Keitho? <laughs> <laughs> I mean I'm already pretty much Odo. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Odie. I I need someone to like, you know. Take me out of the basement and, you know, warm my heart and turn me into a normal person again, too. Oh, boy. So, anyway, uh, Curzo wins a game of Tongo as we find as we find out that Nog failed his test. Perhaps because he was blinded by his Fruit Loop vomit shirt. Look oh, at that shirt, Mike. That is, that is just horrible. I wasn't in a place to make jokes because I was actually heartbroken for him. Yeah, it's. I mean, it's, it's, it's. Uh, it I mean, was you, terribly you, sad. Ex- you expected there's probably funny business at a foot, but I thought, you know, it, there's potential that they're using this as a storytelling device, and that it's, you know, I was like, yeah. So I was sort of crushed for a moment. We're we're gonna we're we have a lot of journeys ahead, but 
I can't imagine like Aaron goes into his trailer for like, okay, get ready for my costume. I got all my makeup, but you want me to wear what? No, I think once you agree to that, like fa- face and teeth, anything they throw your way, you're willing to just accept. Well, speaking of acceptance, uh, strangely, Quark is supportive and says Starfleet doesn't know what they're missing and that he would have made a good officer. Hmm, that's weird. Mm-hmm. Later, Kurzo has played Tongo for so long he gets kicked out of Quark and he and Jedzia head back to Odo's office where they finally get a chance to have a serious talk. Uh, she asks, finally, why he didn't object when she got back into the initiate program after washing her out. And he says, devastatingly, because I felt sorry for you. And this is the worst thing he could have said. And she thinks this confirms that she doesn't have his respect. And this, he doubles down and announces, you know what, I'm just going to stay here in Odo's body. Uh, Because apparently both he and Odo like this new version and want to stay in it. And this is where I, I, I'm curious about Odo's agency here. Because I don't think Odo would go for this. I have thoughts on that. Okay. And I think that it's pretty well handled in, in Odo's scene with her at the end. So let's pin it. Let's pin it okay. until we get there. Okay. So in Act 5, the Guardian explains that there's no way to force Curzon out of Odo. And that Jedzia, well, you'll be fine after the adjustment of losing half of your personality. Jedzia is broken. She's having a crisis of confidence. And Sisko talks to her privately and he knows that Curzon intimidates her and she doesn't want to confront him and Cur- and Cisco says and I thought this was awesome Curzon is my friend and mentor but also he's a selfish asshole mm-hmm. and sometimes he had to confront him and that Curzon be- even even though he is a selfish asshole and I think that's pretty much confirmed in this he always does back off when he knows that he's wrong. This was a really cool beat for many reasons. And I think it, you know, you think about some of the people who are closest to you. I have a roommate, an old roommate that I lived with for almost eight years. Are you talking about me, buddy? No. Oh. Uh, I guess a shoe fits as well, but that's too easy. It's too on the nose. So this roommate I lived with for seven years. She was a girl. We were, like, not romantically involved in any way, shape, or form, um, which I think helped our friendship. But one of the best roommates I ever had in my life. And the reason is, is because I think a friendship, especially a cohabitual friendship, is really relies a lot on know, knowing the, the tide schedule of that ocean, you know? Mm-hmm. Knowing when they're, how to respond in certain ways. Sometimes people are in a mood or whatnot, and you know, you know this is not a good time to, inter- to intervene. This is a time to just yeah. let, them, let them ride. Or you know when they're pressing the wrong buttons and being away, and you have to intercede and say, "Hey, you're being a selfish asshole." And I think it was—it shows a lot of uh, emotional acuity on Ben's part, and also to not to offer to step in and talk to him, but also do it in a way where he's allowing her agency. Because truth be told, she's the one who's going to have to stand up here. I just thought it was a really good. Well, writing. she. Good, good I writing. mean, he. He gives her the tools she needs to solve her own problem, mm-hmm. right? And and that and that there is such um, such power in admitting the truth about stuff like this. Like, mm-hmm. yeah, you know, I love him, but he is an asshole, and you need to approach it this particular way. And like you said, that's that's true in all different types of relationships. Also, great um, to, a chance for because we rarely get to see. Jadzia is so vulnerable, and it's 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 yeah. a it's a it's a it's uncomfortable, and so which I makes it uh, very watchable as well. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's interesting that because Curzon is ostensibly Cisco's best friend. Yeah, and and to then to be able to sort of have that level of clarity in that situation, and what 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 sort of initiated their friendship. Is the connective the piece relationship. right? So now yeah. it's it's really there's a lot, actually a lot of complexity when you it's it's really it complex. Yeah, 
because now it's like the he's having a conversation with the D Curzon Jadzia and you want like so you're like okay so what is the relationship without that part of it? And, and, and I, I think about it like maybe this is like stretching an analogy to the point of absurdity, but like take a uh, take a friendship that has one of the people in the friendship is like famous, mm -hmm. right? Or, or wildly successful in business and it's shiny and it's exciting and like, oh yeah, like I know you as the person, like we go to the Tony Awards together we, you know, we see them on TV and we talk about help you with auditions. And then you have, like, if you delete that, what's the friendship minus the shiny parts? Mm -hmm. And I think this might be that. Well, think about it as an acting exercise, too, for Terry. It's, here's a character you've based around and we've made a big point that, like, you are the, the sum of all of these parts. But now yeah. play it, and they make it really very clear in the episode. It's great writing, writing activity as well that they are like you said extracted from her experience even yeah so how do you how do you show that change it's pretty cool i don't know that and, they and, focus on that but it's cool and whether or not it's because he was the most recent or because he was the most forceful personality i think of jadzia or dax's personalities as we've met her curzon looms largest mm. of all the previous hosts yeah, I like would say he probably could. I think it's we're right to infer that it's because he's he was seems latest. like he's the yeah. he's the loudest in the mm -hmm. in the room. In the soup, and she had direct yeah. experience with him as well. That's the other thing. She knew him firsthand, where she has did not know the others firsthand. It does not appear. You know what I mean? Right, right. Yeah, because she couldn't have. They yeah. were they were long dead. So anyway, very cool. So uh, where am I? So we talked forever. Yeah. Uh, so Quark walks the halls alone when he is accosted by Rom. Quark was way too supportive, and we find out that he rigged the test to make sure that Nog failed. And Rom says, if you interfere again, I will burn your bar to the ground. My son's happiness is more important to me than anything. Hell yeah, That's what Rom. I said. I said, fuck yeah. Yeah. And he's already gotten Cisco to let him take the test again. Uh, this this is such an important moment in the dynamic between the brothers, because you know Quark has been so in charge for so long. Did I this miss is... something in that? Is there any motivation for Quark to have done that outside of just he doesn't think a Ferengi should be part of Starfleet? Like, is there? Is there a, like any a jealousy quotient or a, is did I miss? I I was a little unclear it feels a little about that too. Twirly, I, I, you know, mustache twirly. I I think it's some of it is selfish, right? Because you know there'll always be a place for you here. He wants Nog to keep working at the bar, but I I think he's I think there might be an element for him that he's scared for for Nog to go into Starfleet. That he's he's afraid that he's going to not be successful, or it's dangerous, mm. or something. Um, it also is part of of Quark's relationship with the Ferengi world. Mm -hmm. That the Ferengi world is changing, even though he is pretty progressive within the Ferengi world, it's changing faster than he wants it to. That you could sell me on, you know. And and that's and that's a part of Quark. We've seen that mm -hmm. before. We're going to see that moving forward. The 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 world around him is changing faster than than he's comfortable with but it is interesting it, it, it his motivations are a little bit unclear here anyway so uh we get ready for the second confrontation we have this confrontation second one dax stands up for herself to uh quarko oh, no uh what did i what i oh dex what uh, uh help me uh, what, what? Curzo, Curzo, there it is. You okay, man? You smell toast? <laughs> you know, <laughs> help me out. <laughs> I didn't even know what you were asking me. You're like, what's what's that? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I can't do CPR right now. I'm virtual. <laughs> Put a wallet in my mouth. Someone change right. Uncle Keith's diaper and get him a napkin. Oh, jeez. Oh, give me a juice box. <laughs> 
<laughs> so sounds good. Dax finally stands up for herself with Curzo and says, you can't intimidate me anymore. I'm not a little girl anymore. And this is when we finally get the truth. Curzon was in love with her. And that's why he was so hard on her. And that's why he washed her out. And that's also why he helped her get back in because it let him off the hook for washing her out for shitty reasons. And he says that uh, I should stay out and stay in Odo. The reason I want to stay here is because I'm still in love with you. And it would be really weird if, if now that you know this, when I when you put me back in, you're going to know that. And she says, I love you too, and I want you back. But probably not in the same way. Uh, Renee is so damn good. Still in the Odo makeup, Odo is invisible because I only see Curzon here. Yeah. So let t- so t- tell me your your face says you have feelings about this. Well, but I don't I want I don't want this to feel like I'm responding snowflakey, right? Like it's not that I can't handle that I think it's gross or whatnot. It's just that I don't know that I feel felt like in any of our discussions about Curzon, in any of our discussions about Jadzia's experience with him in the past or whatnot, we don't even hint at this type of relationship, right? We don't even hint that she had any sort of, like, that there was any kind of anything borderlining of a crush or an infatuation. Like, none well, of that. She well, doesn't, she doesn't have a crush on him. He I has know, a crush on her. But... I get, I get it, and he even says he's like. At first, I thought it was just an old man like oogling a young lady. He's like, but then it was right. like more than that. But she never even was like, we got closer, blah blah blah. Like it's no, but I don't. But I, I, I actually buy it completely. He was he. They didn't get close. He was an asshole to her. Yeah, and so, but he like had these feelings because he was he was hiding the fact that he was in love with her, which which happens. I guess it seems. I don't know it. Maybe it's the I don't know. I, 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 it doesn't matter. I mean, I think what 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 works here is that any feelings that I feel oogie boogie about, Renee, Renee is able to supersede yeah. for me, which because well, his I performance mean, I, is genuine enough that you know because they just do such. And I think what it is is they make they hammer they are bold underlining in every seance we have about how pretty she is and how pretty, 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 pretty. And so it just like adds to the kind of ickiness of this old, the older Curzon who's shown himself to be a womanizer, drinking, how's coming on to her basically and being like, I want to stick around because I'm, I'm, I'm digging on you. It, it starts to feel a little gross, but like I said, he's able to bring enough actual emotional empathy to it that. I, I don't think he wants to stay out of her as Odo so they can bang. I don't, I don't think that's his objective. Yeah, he likes being in her company. He, she, yes, I don't no, think it's a, a sexual I, thing I, anymore. But I, no, I no. Well, no, I think he wishes it were. I think he feels, but I I think he feels icky about going back into her. Yes, I I don't think that he is like let's be Odo so we can so we can. Yeah, make and I out. think that is the really cool shift here because she's afraid that she's going to feel all this shame, right? The shame of him being disappointed in her, and he's afraid she's going to feel shame because feel the shame of his. Yeah, so it yeah. works. I'm, 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 it's funny. Yeah. I'm, it sounds like I'm arguing against the beat. I'm not. It's just, in fact, it's very impressive. I think they took a, a dangerous leap here because this could be icky, and it turns out that they're able to well, thread it, the needle. I mean, it it is icky. But I think that's the story. I mean, because yeah. like yeah. you know, because because let's say we were like you had a student, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, fair. And 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 she comes in and she's like twenty one and she's like crazy hot and talented and really fun, and you're like, I have icky feelings towards you, but it's wildly inappropriate. Both because you are my student, you, like you're perfectly legal, but but you're my student and I'm also twice your age. This is wrong. I need to push you off to a different teacher mm-hmm. because like I'm I'm feeling all of these feelings and she might feel like oh you rejected me when really I was like I can't Actually I, yeah I, I think don't. he actually did the most appropriate thing because you're right those are human experiences and human feelings and you can't ignore that they, they exist but the right thing you do instead of the every other piece of media which is where the teacher and the student bang and it's just keep it a right. secret versus he's like I'm going to distance you 
I'm not even going to mention it to you because that's probably inappropriate as well. Right. It's 100%. not until now. Because you yeah. don't want to like put it in that, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm too horny for you. You got to go. To, you know. So it's so like <laughs> you want to do it solid. But what he did wrong was instead of transfer her to a different supervisor or whatever, he washed her out of the program, yeah. then felt bad about it and helped her get back in. So, but like that is a very human situation. And like it is icky mm-hmm. that he was so horn dogging her, but also perfectly understandable. And so like it's I, I actually thought it was a very like Yeah, you know what? I feel much better about it now. I feel much, I feel very good about it now. Yeah, well, well there we go. No, I I'm sort it. of horn do- doggy about him now. <laughs> look at that look at that wig. I'm telling you, and he's given like the you know, the blue steel. Yeah. He's, he's, He's doing it, yeah. All right, well, there you go. Uh, anyway, I'm gonna print she that one out. Wants... Print, print screen. Hmm, there it is. She, he's basically giving you. He's giving you Trump's mugshot. So, <laughs> he's like a, I think he was trying to do blue steel, but he kind of came out just pirate. He's like the makeup's very tight. Very, makeup's very tight. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, so uh, later in Quarks, so it looks like Nosferatu, doesn't he? He definitely does. Yeah. Oh, Renee would have done an amazing oh, Nosferatu. God, yeah. But yeah. you want to know what he did do? Mm-hmm. Did you know that Renee Auberginois was in Dance of the Vampires on Broadway? I didn't know that. Oh goodness! <laughs> the most spectacularly bad show I have ever seen in my life. Keith, sorry, this is my second rant, oh, rando tangent of the episode, uh, but it's somewhat connected. I found a YouTube video looking for something else before Patrick Stewart had Patrick Stewarted, right? He's sure. he's a young uh, student, and there is video of him in an, a Shakespeare masterclass where he is the student. Yeah. And there is, have you seen it? No, and but somebody I'd love is to like he's doing me. a scene from Richard the Third, and he's being like coached and talked. And I was like, it's so crazy to see like Shakespearean legend Patrick Stewart being right. taught. It's really fascinating. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, it's. I mean, all these people. I mean, and Renee, you know what he looks like? Exactly the same. Exactly, I think he came no. out of the womb looking like Patrick Stewart. Uh, absolutely he's he got was, you know the he, hair he was a bald that, baby the hair yeah. never came in <laughs> yeah it's crazy to me <laughs> mother i need a bottle uh the, you know because renee did, did a lot of right he was the original cast of big river with john goodman this i did know yes yeah well there you go it's around anyway uh, later in quarks rom comes in to announce that uh not rom yes nog passed the test and Nog Nog comes in wearing the cadet uniform. Hold Cisco, on, there's some great con- screenshots here. I just have to appreciate them. Yeah. Okay. God, the, the, the amount of acting that Renee can do under all that prosthetic with his face is amazing. So uh, Cisco congratulates Rom. Hooray, he did it. But he reminds him, uh, you're not in yet. You're not allowed to wear that uniform. Uh, he's only now allowed to apply to go to Starfleet. Yeah, but Nog gives you all the emotional acuity here back. He's like, hey, you know, it's for my dad. For my dad. You can get it. And 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 he does. And Cisco's like, gotcha. And love it. Love that whole thing. Then O'Brien jokes, which I thought is funny, but also true, that as soon as Nog graduates from the Academy, he's going to have to call him sir. Because, of course, O'Brien is an enlisted member, not an officer. Uh, hilarious. Quark reluctantly asks Nog what he wants to drink, and he says root beer, because that's what the cadets drink. So Quark is reluctantly forced to order root beer, but as he says, this is the end of Ferengi civilization. Which yeah. he's, it's a joke there, but I think that actually is part of yeah, what his subject right. is here. Mm-hmm. So lastly, Odo, full Odo now, goes to apologize to Jadzia. She says, don't sweat it. And thank you for the memory of what it feels like to be a changeling. I never knew how much joy it brought you. And Odo says, I learned a lot about the joys humans take in partying. And So that's said, what I think explains your wormhole, right? Because I don't think he's had a taste of the human experience like that. 
and not only yeah. the human experience. So it's like, okay, let's say you're gonna like experiment with drugs for the first time, right? Well, you some most people, some t people like have a beer or maybe they smoke a joint or something, right? right? Well, what if instead of that, like we gave you just like a full dose of Molly and just you're just in the shower, like oh, I can hear, I can feel every water drop hit me. And I think that's what Odo was experiencing in the moment, the full human party down experience. And so for the moment he was willing to be like, yeah, I hope this never ends. And then probably the next That's morning he's like, true. my head is fucking I, killing Cause I, me. I feel like Curzon was like drunk the entire time. Yeah, the, so Odo- the instant he was in there, he was pounding it the It wasn't that Odo tang. I think had fully bought onto the plan. I think he was just a little too buzzed to really give it the full thought. And I think we reinforce over and over again, the, the force of Curzon's personality. Mm -hmm. And that so Curzon might have been selling it like we had a 50-50 split here, and it might not have been. Well, and I, and I don't think this is as deep a point, but the writers put it there, so let's put it there. Let's go a little. Uh, you love we love to lay on the, the therapy couch, Keith. Who sure better do. than Odoix knows the feeling of uh, unrequited love and the shame thereof? Sure, you know right? What I mean? They had they had they had a lot in common there. So he's like, yeah, I'm feeling you, brah. Yeah. So no, there it is. Odo says he must have been a remarkable man. And Dax says, yes, he is. Because he's still there inside her. So there we go. That is the episode. And it we just roll time. credits there, too. Like, that's... That's it. That's all we need. Yeah. Let's, uh, let's move along home, shall we? Okay, let us begin as we always do with wormholes in the plot, Mike. It's funny. I was really kind of invested in this episode. I didn't clock too many. Uh, I, you know, there's the, the 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 her choice of friends. I think is was interesting to me. I didn't. I, a lot of them made sense. Some didn't. I think some were clearly production necessities. Like Rosalind Chow wasn't there, and right. So that's a wormhole that's worth noting, but we clearly understand why it took place, right? Right. Uh, to be fair, I guess the 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 magic MacGuffin, the voodoo of it all, of how it works and the sciency of it, I think. Well, it's, it's it's telepathic powers. That's just part of Star Trek. Yeah, right. That's what I'm saying. But I mean, like, we could probably get into the weeds with that. I'm trying to think. Yeah, no. I mean, my biggest question going in was, you know, what what ramifications do you get if one of those things isn't a humanoid being? And I think we dealt with that pretty succinctly, so that's not a wormhole. I feel pretty good about it, to be honest with you. Yeah, I mean, I, other the, the than- why, I think the why is Quark yeah, gonna Quark's thwart motivation. his nephew is, seems fucked up. It just seems more, here's what it seems. We've explained, I think, a pretty good idea of it. I get it. But like, destroy his dreams, it's, it would, if they had made it a little, clear like with if his like this is the death of Ferengi society if he really thought it was for his own good if he really believed that right I feel like he wouldn't have had to be so secretive and nefarious about it and underhanded oh, but about that's it. how Quark does yeah, everything I guess so it just there's something about it Quark just is of all the characters I feel like Quark is the most inconsistent for me mm -hmm. right his motivations don't always gel with this the level growth. of villainy. Yeah, and his growth yeah. sometimes, and then he, sometimes he's like the hero, or he's really emotionally intelligent. Sometimes he turns it off, and I'm sure that is the complexities of people of, of beings. But yeah, I think he's the most easy to rewrite to serve the plot that we are dealing with currently, rather than any sort of consistency across the series. So, I would say his motivations here are a wormhole for me, though we can shoehorn an explanation. That's my feeling. Yeah, I, I think that I, I agree with you. I, I would have liked to have a little bit better explanation for why Quark did that. However, I'm I'm absolutely certain in the comments, uh, some very smart people are going to explain it to us and that we missed a line yeah, in the show sure. that would have explained it. Uh, so I look forward to uh, you guys closing that wormhole. Let's talk about our best moment. So, there's so much good stuff. There's yeah. so much good stuff that... Uh, I mean, Renee giving a master class across everything. 
I think Terry Farrell needs a special shout out because it's her episode and she carries it. And yeah. the there she she expresses multitudes within a, a plot that is expressing the multitudes within her. So it's excellent, but I cannot I have to go with my heart, and my heart is that scene where Rom kicks Quark's ass emotionally and verbally. It just, I think it does so much. Yes, it's a beat we've seen before, which is a complaint I will express, but it is so powerful, and he so rarely gets a scene like that in the show. He dutifully yeah. serves his Rom part, but every once in a while they give him just like a couple of lines, and he just lays it in, and he means it. When he he f scares the shit out of Quark, which ain't easy he to does. do, and it's just great. And because the, I think Ben and and I think Ben and Jake have such a great father son relationship, love it. But but theirs has always kind of been easy, right? Like they've kind of always right. been been cool. This has not been the case with Nog and Rom. And so every time he comes to his fight, and he's so proud of him, and you it you can feel that pride. And as someone who kind of would yeah. love to hear that from my dad. It always strikes me so so viscerally, and so I it is my best moment for this episode. Yeah. No, I I mean I, I was I was going to choose that if you if you didn't, um, for all of those reasons, and I, I think the the parallels because the 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 father son duality in this in this series is is really interesting that it, it is I I think they had no idea that the uh, that Nog. <laughs> and uh, and Rom were ever going to be as integral to the show as they, I mean, Rom wasn't even a wasn't even a character in the beginning. Yeah, right. We met Nog. We didn't even think about it. Um, but now thinking about it's it's funny you could talk about the Cisco's being like cool, right? And it is they're they're the cool kids, father and son. They're like the elites, and then you have you have the two Ferengis who are like the not cool ones. But the but the parallels there are really strong. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah. Max Grodenchik does such a phenomenal job. Um, but just for the sake of variation, for me, it's going to be uh, the last scene with Renee um, and Terry because of the sort of emotional pathos there that Renee brings. It's, you know, I I like the writing of it. It makes sense. It is a little icky. It is a little uncomfortable. But I think it's realistic and human and the type of thing that... Um, you wouldn't really see on a lot of other Star Trek to get into sort of that icky territory yeah. that they would have certainly a profession of love would have happened, but like the sort of acknowledgement and they allowed it to be a little like, oof, this is uncomfortable. And I think that Which was... I think then, you know, to retroactively go back and address one of our initial wormholes we didn't bring up again, which is a sort of the seduction of Quark in front of everybody in that first scene. <laughs> right. I guess that tracks, right? Like that part of Dax is part of what we learn is part of her, right? There's a little bit of a, maybe an uncomfortable, uh, or a, not maybe an uncomfortable, a, a, a utilization of the, those icky parts to get what you want. Yeah, I mean, and we don't really know what Jadzia's feelings are on this, but Jadzia Dax has, we know that she's a little bit of a horn dog. And 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 there's nothing wrong with that. Like we're sex positive, absolutely. However, like we know, like she gets around, and that maybe that's a piece of Curzon in there. So, there you go. Uh, it's time now to throw out some stem bolts. Come on. Aww. You get some stem bolts. Two, three, four. Hell yeah. All right. Well, you know, what I, here's what I, there, there's a lot of cool stuff in this episode. Definitely, uh, we'll get to them all. But I, one thing I thought I didn't expect so much was, because we know, we, they've done a really good job, especially in that first season of explaining a lot of the symbiote stuff, the, the trill stuff. And... One thing I guess I didn't think I was going to... I didn't think there was as much more to learn about it. I thought just this... Mm. But, but like I said earlier in, in our discussion, was seeing them and seeing Dax interact with her, some of her, the various different hosts, 
showed me kind of something that sets her apart from, let's say, the data of of a TNG, right? Whereas, yeah, he's he benefit. They all benefit. This they benefit from his sort of. It's like he's basically the early internet, right? He's the entirety right. of cultural it's knowledge. Ask Jeeves. And, yeah. And in some ways, Dax serves that very same purpose because her experience goes back so far. But right. there's a difference in that, whereas Data had all of this actual d- data, right? Factoid knowledge. She has a ton of acquired in, uh, life in, experience intellect but also yes experience uh, and I guess I, I knew that but now I felt it right it, 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 and how that's very useful that's yeah. incredibly useful and powerful and not only does she have all of that experience and knowledge and we got to see that like oh my you had basically she had a she has like political experience She's got a lot of physical experience, like She's ba- a battle. gymnast, yep. a politician, leader of the Symbiosis Commission, brilliant scientist, uh, horn dog ambassador, yeah, but serial killer. Yeah, which <laughs> like, like that's, that is a as Liam Nielsen would said, a very specific set of skills, right? It's <laughs> true. Um, and I really got that now, and I'm like, oh, she's like, basically, it's basically the Matrix, right? They're just loading yeah. this stuff into her. That's a good analogy. Yeah. Uh, so it's like really cool and really impactful, and. And it turns out that whereas it could seem very early on the episode that the the voodoo thing, what's it called? The what's the ceremony called? Well, the quinceañera is the just quinceanera, yes. a a MacGuffin to get everybody to play different characters and for bat mitzvah. Yeah. yeah, but instead it actually is show turns out to be exactly what they say it is. It's an incredibly moving experience for her because she and I, the viewer, actually learned a lot from it and grew a lot from it. So. Yeah. Wow, what a vehicle, right? What it a does cool... tons for the Dax character. Yeah, blew blew me away that because I really was like, okay, this is the trope of the episode. But no, man, I, it's I thought it was gonna be a Freaky Friday ex- excuse to Freaky Friday everybody. Right, right. And it is briefly, but it's it turns out to be Not much really more that. than that. Yeah. Also, want to credit the episode for the big swerve for me is it's clearly set when you, just when they even propose the idea at the beginning of the episode, I'm like, oh, it's gonna be about the the serial killer. We're returning back to that beat. And right. I'm glad that they didn't do that because A, it's a cool swerve, and B, we did that. We did that episode already. We dealt with right. that. And we're going to do it better later. Yeah, and so letting Renee kind of go wild with Curzon and dealing a little bit with his relationship and not making it be about his relationship with Ben, really, and dealing with this whole new kind of thing was really, really cool. I liked it. I don't really have any complaints with it. I loved the Rom B story. Yeah. Let's talk about last week, where the B story was, let's play darts and break your arm. But who cares? Right. Who gives a shit? This week, the B story, I think, emotionally was equal to, and in some parts, greater than the A story. If you're into that relationship. I can see some people be like, I don't give a crap with going on but I, I would be... Hard pressed about Ron, about Nog. Everybody cares about Nog. I'm glad. I'm just saying. I know some people are like, oh, the Ferengi episodes, and I guess that's they usually focus on the brothers. But I think this this continues the brotherly conflict we saw in the movie episode, maybe better because I think Rom's at his best when he's defending uh, Nog. Nog, and I, you know, I love my nieces and nephews. I, I, but I appreciate that not having children, I will miss a yeah. piece of life experience, right? You can't sure. ever mimic that. But right. I would say that though we, Quark is happy to do, and we've seen us point out all the failures that Rom has had uh, it, as a Ferengi, as perhaps, you know, like he's just like walling away at his brother's bar. He doesn't have his own sort of, he could have been a this, he could have been a that. But his greatest achievement is not just his son and what his son will do, but his fight against his brother and Ferengi culture in order to facilitate that journey for his son. And I think it's beautiful. I think it's moving. And it does more to, in some ways, expresses a parental, uh, to, to communicate that thing I'm missing in my life experience better than the Cisco's do in some ways. I can't explain it or articulate it better than that, but it really strikes me. And because it comes easy for Ben. 
yeah, and it do. comes hard for Nog. To, like the the same doing the same action is much harder for Nog. Mm-hmm. And you know, it's 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 important. It's in, Avery Brooks says it in his interviews. It's important we see those relationships. And it's yes, is there a little bit lack of like maternal storytelling in this series so far? Yeah, maybe a little bit. You could probably make that argument. But yep, well for sure. Yep. But. In 90s TV, this was lacking. It, hell, in today's TV, oh. this is lacking. So I think it's important and it's really moving to me. And, and it bumps, I'm telling you, the B story really bumps this episode up for me. Where I would say I was middling in the sort of like probably light 80s, it's bumping it up for me. And I'm going to say 89 self sealing stem bolts. Sorry for that diatribe. I really went off there. But no, I mean, I, I think that this episode, Facets is an underrated gem, I think. I, I, I think it is it is one that I remember. It's one that I've thought about. It's as we were watching the Dax episodes previous to this, this was the one I was always anticipating and thinking about um, because I think it's really complex and layered and a, and a beautiful story. I mean, it really is. So um, it's not one of those episodes that, is like, oh, the top 10 or the top 20 episodes of Deep Space Nine. But I think it is much better than it gets credit for. Yeah. I usually just do this at the end, but the IMDb ranking for this is 120 out of 173. Wow. So by IMDb, this is a below average, a well, well below, well below average, average yeah. episode of Deep Space Nine. And I disagree. I think Yeah, it, that surprises I mean, me. It's, you know... It, yeah, there, there aren't any pew pews, and there's not like great peril for the station's not about to blow up. But I think as a, as a character storytelling thing, and yes, of course, the story structure is not typical TV. Like we don't know what the plot is until three quarters of the way through the episode. I don't care. I think it's a really, it's a really good episode. It's it's got moments of fun. It's emotionally complex. The performances are great. We continue the Nog journey, which is. Um, one of those, one of the greatest, most beautiful parts of Deep Space Nine is Nog's journey, and we we are just beginning. We are just scratching the circuit, the surface of what Nog's journey is going to be, um, and it's super fun. I really enjoyed it. Uh, I, I this is one I will happily rewatch. So for me, it gets ninety point five self sealing stem bolts. Uh, we're, we're right in that same wheelhouse. Good. We are we are right in there, which means next week we are going to be discussing the season finale of season three of Deep Space Nine, The Adversary, and then we are going to begin season four. I've and, heard many things about season uh, four, Keith. Holy shit! You know you know how I, I give you that note, like Mike, pay attention to this yeah, one. Yeah, like maybe the first all of the episodes starting with season four uh but season season four starts off real freaking strong okay. so uh all season so, finale are we feeling good about next week too or i, I don't want to give it away all right. but uh but yeah so we are going to be discussing the adversary next week Woo! Ugh, I'm so excited yeah all right so uh we will let uh, yeah, you can check out all of our other shows. Look at my Star Trek toys, K and M Geekly. Look at my uh I said that. Um what is the other one we do? Yeah, the Strange New Show. Yeah, we watch uh, Strange New Worlds and all of that fun stuff. Our social nonsense is below. Uh thank you so much for watching. You can join the Patreon at patreon.com slash K and M. We will see you back here next week with the adversary. Till then, this has been Keith and Mike. Watch Deep Space Nine. Thank you for watching KM Entertainment. If you enjoyed our particular brand of nonsense, please like and subscribe. Or become one of our patrons at patreon.com slash KM.